we are brainwashed with two four letter words, free will. There is no such thing. I would go so far as to say it's a demonic deception. Thanks to um, Vogel, I believe it was, who sent me a clip of Mark Driscoll um, saying something that seems quite provocative. Uh, that doesn't probably surprise you if you know anything about Mark Driscoll. In fact, uh, instead of delaying too much, just let's just jump right in. He's talking about foreknowledge, of course, from a semi-quasi-Lutheran Calvinist position based upon things we've heard Mark say. He's kind of changed over the the years, as far as I can tell, based upon the teachings that I've, I've heard him teach. But listen to what he says. The reason why we struggle with this concept of foreknowledge is because we are brainwashed with two four-letter words. Free will. There is no such thing. I would go so far as to say it's a demonic deception. Okay, now that's just provocative uh, because he's going to go on uh, to talk about a lot of different things which actually affirms that he even believes in some aspect of freedom of the will. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the whole compatibilist argument is that, yes, human responsibility, i.e. compatibilistic free will is true, but so is God's sovereignty, i.e. determinism. And what they, what they say is that your will is free as long as you're doing what you want. So even compatibilist Hardline Calvinists say we believe in free will, but they define free will as doing what one wants to do, doing what is consistent with one's nature. So even they would possibly use the term free will. Um, also, he's not real clear. He doesn't define what he means by free will when he calls it a demonic deception. Again, I think he's just being provocative here. He likes saying provocative things from the stage. I think that's what um, sometimes uh, Mark Driscoll is kind of known for. Um, but he uses, he, he jumps categories of different concepts of free will throughout this discussion. So he, he's really not being clear with his audience. Now, more than likely, his audience isn't following this. They're probably not trained in philosophy or uh, even very depth in theology. Um, and so he, they're, they're not noticing his jump. He'll, he'll, you'll notice he, he first talks about free will as if it's a political issue, like your freedom to choose who's going to be your next president or the freedom of democracy. And then he'll jump to a kind of an ontological uh, category. And talking about free will is kind of a superpower, this unlimited, unfettered ability to do anything, like flap your arms and fly or to do anything. And, uh, and, and no theologian I know of speaks of free will in either one of those categories. In other words, we're not talking about the political ability to choose your representatives, and we're not talking about uh, superpower, uh, the, the unfettered ability to do absolutely anything, or the fact that we somehow become more powerful than God if we have uh, abilities to choose between available options. Um, and then the other, the other way he'll speak of free will is, um, that it, he'll, he'll deny altogether that sin, if you hold to free will, that in some way you, you deny that sin has any influence on people with free will. And of course, no theologian believes that either. Every, every theologian, even those who affirm libertarian free will still affirm that sin influences us. We don't believe that sin is determinative and that it determines us to be incapable of responding to God's appeals to sinners, but we do believe that sin has an impact. Sin does influence. It's just not determinative. We are the determiners. Uh, desires and sinful inclinations, those kinds of things, are influences, not determiners. And so um, all of those are mistakes, I think, or maybe overstatements uh, from Doc, from uh, Mark Driscoll that, that I think mislead people into thinking what he's saying is actually a, a fair representation of the two sides uh, being debated in the theological realm, and it's simply not. Um, this may help. Let me put this up on the screen. Uh, I created this years ago just because I think it really helps to describe uh, libertarian freedom uh, from what the actual theological distinction is that we're getting into. And we're going to listen to the rest of Driscoll's clip here. It's about a five-minute clip that we're going to listen to, so bear with me. But here, here it is defined, because that's always important, because he doesn't define anything there. He just kind of dogmatically states free will is, uh, you know, satanic and it's demonic. And I have to ask, did he say that freely? And then if he did say it freely, is he demonic? <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, it, it really is kind of silly when you think about the, the statement in and of itself. Um, so here, here it is defined, at least the theological category of what free will, will is, is what we're talking about when we talk about libertarian free will. Uh, with regard to our responsibility in light of the gospel, okay? 
the categorical ability of the will to refrain or not refrain from a given moral action, i.e. to accept the gospel or to reject the gospel. So the gospel is an appeal made by God to us to be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you have the moral capacity to respond positively or negatively to that appeal? We say yes. The Calvinist says no. Okay. And, and maybe some Lutherans like uh, they're quasi Calvinist or quasi Lutheran, whatever Mark <laughs> claims to be. Okay. Um, it is it, the other de definition. It's self-determined. In other words, we're the source. This is source libertarianism. We're the source of our choices. In other words, there's no factors outside of the agent's control causing or determining his choices, his moral choices, at least. Okay. So he's self-determined, not determined by factors beyond the accountable agent's control. Contra-causal is another word that's used. The moral ability to choose otherwise. And so if I rejected Christ, I had the moral capacity to have accepted Christ. There's nothing that was keeping me, my natural inclinations from birth, uh, the way in which God made me, that's keeping me from choosing Christ when presented with the gospel. Uh, even if I spend my entire life rejecting the gospel, it's not because of a lack of the grace of God's provision. It's not a lack of God's desire. It's not a lack of of Christ's atonement or something like that, which is exactly the implication of the Calvinistic system is that the reason people reject God is ultimately because he first rejected them and he created them to be unable to accept him. It takes a miracle to accept him and he doesn't give everybody that miracle, which you'll hear Mark explain actually uh, later in this, this sermon. Um, now, what about the biblical arguments? It's one thing to philosophically define what you mean, but what are some examples in the scripture of where free will is clearly laid out? Well, here are a few. People say, oh, it's never in the Bible. Free will is mentioned much more. It's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a, as implicit and explicit as even the Trinity, probably even more so than the triune nature of God. And and to, to just dogmatically ad hoc say, well, the Bible never talks about free will, is just to ignore the Bible. I don't I don't understand where people are coming from when they say things like that. Okay, so here are the biblical verses. First First Corinthians seven uh, thirty seven. He who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will and has decided in his own heart. Now. You say, well, that's not in, re in reference to salv salvation. That's not soteriological. Okay, that doesn't have to be to establish that free will is taught, taught in the Bible. We don't have to talk about the freedom of the will only soteriologically in order to establish that libertarian free will is taught in the Bible, is demonstrated in the Bible. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, speaking to Christians, but such is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but when you are tempted, you will be provided a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. So you may say, oh, well, this is talking about Christians. Christians have the, the liberty of the will to, res to, to restrain from any temptation. Okay, well, then you've established the liberty of the will, free will, in the Bible. It's not a demonic deception then, right? Okay, so you got to be clear. If you're, if you're saying free will is a de demonic de deception, you need to say, okay, not, not just free will in general, like the free will of Adam and Eve or the free will of the Christian to accept or uh, uh, to, to fall into temptation or not. No, we're, we're talking about the free will specifically of lost people to accept or reject the gospel appeal. And you could say that is a deception from the devil if you want to. And you got to make that argument. Okay, and you got to you got to wonder why the first four hundred years of the Christian Church believed it and taught it exclusively, and you got to wonder why most Christians throughout human history have believed it and taught it. God decreed for Satan's deception to be just so effective to deceive that many people. It, it's really strange when you when you begin to think about the claims of the system. First Corinthians nine seventeen. For if you do this, if for if I do this of my own will, I have reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with stu with a stewardship. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Exodus 35, 29. All the men and women and the people of Israel whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord has commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. And there are many, many more. These are just a few verses picked out to demonstrate a, a examples of libertarian free will. Now, the last section here I have is confessional. In other words, what do the confessions that Calvinists even respect say? Now, this is the London Baptist Confession of 1689, which I think Driscoll has referenced. I, I, I can't be sure of that, but I know a lot of our Calvinist friends reference this confession. Uh, it's taken directly from the Westminster Confession, a leading Calvinistic source. And what is this establishing? It's establishing the freedom of the will in Adam and Eve, which Mark Driscoll later in this sermon actually acknowledges, which is strange because he's just called free will a demonic deception, 
And yet he establishes that Adam and Eve were created with this exact same free will. So was the free will Adam and Eve have had a, demo, a demonic deception too? See, he's not, he's not clear in what he's calling a demonic deception. Um, the confessions say God has endowed human will with a natural liberty and power to act on choices so that it's neither forced nor inherently bound by nature to do good or evil. And there are verses quoted there. Humanity in the state of innocence had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God. Yet this condition was unstable so that humanity could fall from it. Now you may say, oh, that's talking about pre-fall man. C correct. That's perfectly fine. But we've established libertarian free will in the Bible and in the confessions that you, many of you Calvinists hold to. That's all we have to do. And you say, well, that's not all you have to do. You have to establish that it's true of every person after the fall too. No, we don't. Here's why. If you try to make the dichotomy between sovereignty and free will and say, if free will is true, the libertarian freedom that you believe in, you libertarians out there, then sovereignty just is, you just undermine God's sovereignty. Really? Was God sovereign in the garden prior to the fall? Case closed. Shut, shut the book, ladies and gentlemen. You've just lost the debate. If you believe that Adam and Eve had libertarian free will, and you believe that somehow contradicts God's sovereignty, then you have just said God wasn't sovereign in the garden. You can't have your cake and eat it too. This is why we saw the guys down in Houston when they debated Jonathan Pritchett and I, and Jonathan Pritchett's famous lines, free will is not a superpower, and we quoted their own confession, which we affirmed with them prior to the debate. This is the confession you hold to. We even sent them this chapter and said, you affirm these points because it was a debate over free will. And they said, yes, watch them in the cross-examination, run from, and then become hostile, yelling at us, because we want them simply on the stage to affirm that God did give Adam and Eve a libertarian free choice. Why, why, did, why did they run from that? Why did they not want to affirm that? You know why they didn't want to affirm it. Because if they affirm that, then they have to affirm it is possible for God to be sovereign while men still have libertarian free will. You, you just you can't have your cake and eat it too, Calvinist. And, and we're going to call you on your inconsistencies. This is why you have more consistent Calvinists like Chris Date and others, um, Bing Yong and others, who come right out and say, no, well, God decreed the first choice too. In other words, the reason Adam and Eve ultimately chose to eat of the forbidden fruit is because God decreed him to. In other words, they recognize that you can't give libertarian freedom to Adam and Eve either, because if you do, they give up their entire philosophical worldview and the underpinning of their entire worldview in their system. And they know it. And that's why you get more consistent Calvinist things. People who've actually thought through these things like Chris Date has, they don't go so far as people like Mark Driscoll, who are more on a surface level, kind of a theologian, hasn't thought through these things very well. 